Hi everybody and welcome to the Reaper 101 part 2 where we talk about the uh, the usual argument between Macs, PCs, Windows, Linux, Mac OS, all that kind of stuff. This is part 2 of a 10 part series where we go from the absolute basics of using Reaper, the audio production software, through to getting you to being able to do quite a lot with the software. This series is brought to you in collaboration with Pro Mix Academy because we also have the ultimate Reaper guide, which is the real massive start to finish, absolutely everything you could possibly want to know that's relevant to a mix engineer, you know, a recording person, uh, a voiceover artist, someone who wants to work with Reaper with video. Uh, we do a full breakdown of everything, including a whole section where we record, mix and master a band using the stock inbuilt plugins. So check that out in the description below. Now, the old Mac versus PC debate. The, the short answer is it doesn't really matter these days. It used to be a lot more of a big deal, but it all depends now on what you want, what you can afford, and where you see yourself going in the future, I guess. In front of me, this is a MacBook Air M2. So as of the time of making this video, this is the most up-to-date portable uh, Mac laptop that you can get. They, they make the Pro versions as well, but they're also the M2 series. And behind me is my studio production PC. And I have a couple of other things to show you as well. I, for a long time, was a PC guy and still am. It's uh, not something where I'm like, you know, nail the colors to the mast and it's like PC or death or Mac or death. It's, I don't really care either way. I'm always pragmatic about this, which means that, you know, I take everything into consideration. How much money do I have to spend? What do I need? Will I need to upgrade this in the future? What is it doing? And over the years, there has been a clear dividing line, for me at least, between the needs of somebody who works in audio and audio production and someone who works in video production. They are two very different things with very different needs. Generally speaking, in my experience, if you do video production, Mac stuff is not really the answer unless you have money to burn. But with audio stuff, it's about the same now because of the way that production has gone over the years. This, and I've shown this on the channel a couple of times before, is my old, my dad's old uh, G3 Power Mac, one of the first flat screen ones. It was really cool looking at the time, and it doesn't actually weigh that much, which is why I can lift it up by the neck, which is bolted in, by the way, don't worry. He says, bashing it, there's no drives in it anymore, it barely functions. But that, I did a video a few years back and I ran Reaper on it. Uh, I think it was version 4.8 or something like that was the last version that was compiled for that particular piece of hardware. And that uses a PowerPC processor, which they've not been made for the public for you know, 20 years or so. Uh, not since Apple moved to Intel, which was in about, what, 2002, 2003? So that's a 20 plus year old machine and it can still run Reaper. And as long as you're not asking far too much of it in terms of uh, effects and processing and complicated routing, it still works. And the audio quality, importantly, is absolutely identical between that and this ultra modern machine. Why is that? Because I have to explain to you in, in some way how a digital audio workstation works. Um, stop me if you've heard this one before, but basically like this, this is an audio interface. This is an Audion ID24 right here on the desk. It's that piece of equipment's job to take audio and turn it into a digital signal in as, as high a quality as it possibly can. That connects by USB, and as long as there are drivers available or what we call class compliant modes with any machine, whether it be a Windows machine, a Linux machine, a Mac OS machine, or anything else, as long as the audio can get from this to software, the quality that is recorded on that other device will be identical across the board. 
So that's why I've done videos before on using like a Raspberry Pi, you know, the tiny little uh, portable uh, Linux machine. Um, I've done loads of videos on with uh, this Lenovo laptop, which my wife rather cheekily put an Apple sticker on, but it's, it's a PC laptop. And it really comes down mostly to two things. Firstly, and the simplest one, depending on how old your machine is, is how fast is your storage? You thought I'd say CPU, didn't you? But no, storage first. If you've got an old spinning hard drive that's lumbering around, you try recording 24 tracks of audio at once, you know, if you've got a big kind of recording rig, and that hard drive might well struggle to try and get all that audio into separate files at the same time. If that same ancient machine had a solid state drive in it or a faster hard drive, it would probably perform much better. I've kind of proven this with that ancient Mac by putting in a compact flash card, which, you know, that's that's the old kind of camera standard solid state reading thing, which was never really meant to run a PC, but it can do it. And in that absolutely ancient video that I did, which just for fun, I recorded that on a crap old uh, camcorder, um, and that didn't seem to go down very well, so I didn't do any more videos like that. Um, they, they, the whole thing performed fine. As soon as I started to process the audio with things like equalizers and compressors, then the computer really started to struggle because of the second thing that's needed, and that is CPU power. Reaper is incredibly CPU efficient. It is very well organized. It, it, the code base, as far as I'm told, is very clean. And in that way, it can run the latest version of Reaper on very old machines. And it's only when you start to really manipulate audio that you start to really incur a lot of processor cost, so to speak. If you use all the stock Reaper plugins, you can use an ancient laptop or desktop and it will just carry on regardless. It probably won't care at all. The buffer size for latency would probably be much more sensitive with a much older machine because the older the machine gets, uh, the more processing time it would probably need to keep that buffer ready and full of new audio, whether it's live recorded or whether it's mixed later. But even then you can do things that we'll look at in later parts of this series, like rendering tracks, freezing tracks, so any processing that was on those tracks gets baked into a new wave file. So all it's really doing when you hit play, if there are no effects, is it's just taking the wave files off a hard drive, timesing them by a number, so the volume slider uh, just kind of multiplies the volume by something. So if you've got if you're playing back uh, a file and the volume slider is at minus 6 dB, I happen to know that that's half the volume. So they'll just times the volume on that track by 0.5 and then feed it out the master, which then goes out of your interface. That is something that computers from the late 90s can do. It's when we get into things like analog emulations of things, like analog tape emulation, analog console em em emulation, really clever new plugins like Soothe that have got this very advanced ultra multiband stuff going on. Uh, Kazrog recently did an emulation of the Avalon 747, which was really accurate, but even on the monster of a machine behind me, um, I had 16 copies of that running and that poor thing was, was flagging. It was really struggling. Uh, there has been an update since that makes it much easier to run, but the more advanced we get with audio processing, the more that plugin developers who make the effects uh, feel like they can make their software more advanced. And that means that they can you know, do things they were never able to do before or make things sound more realistic, more authentic to the, the, the piece of gear it's trying to copy or you know, more deep dive with oversampling and kind of things that really make my brain hurt. But the long story short is you probably don't need to spend crazy money 
on your production computer if you're looking to invest at the moment, if that's why you're watching this video. I would highly suggest use what you have. Start off with, if you've got an old laptop or an old Mac or an old machine, whatever you have, just get going. And almost all the plugin manufacturers these days make exactly the same plugins for Mac and PC. Not so much for Linux, which is kind of a pain, although on a lot of Linux distros you can use a thing called Wine, which means you can run the Windows versions of uh, plugins and of Reaper and that kind of thing. Um, there's the LV2 plugin standard and now there's one called Clap, which I've not really had time to investigate yet. But that's all coming with Linux and with things like the Steam Deck, you know, the, the handheld game console, I had one of those for a while. Uh, Steam OS runs on Linux and I was running Reaper quite well on that. And then I ran Windows on that thing and it, it ha handled the third party plugins that I wanted to run much better. So it really depends what you need and don't pay more than you have to. Things like graphics cards, for example, they, they have no bearing on audio really. Uh, there is a company called GPU Audio that are trying to get really complex plugins shifted to using graphics cards. They're also like, uh, M1 and M2 Mac uh, compatible with those guys, but they're still on the cutting edge. That's not yet the standard. That's not the de facto. So right now, uh, the processor, the CPU, is king. These M1 and M2 Macs are really efficient, but because they're still quite new, a lot of the plugin developers are still catching up and aren't making native Apple Silicon versions of their plugins yet. But for Reaper, that's not a problem because Reaper can natively, per plugin, do a thing called a bridge, where if I'm, if I'm using the Apple Silicon M2 version of Reaper and the plugin that I try and load is only available for Intel processors, it will run that isolated in what's called Rosetta mode, where it will run that as if it was on an Intel platform, which uses significantly more processing to do that live in real time, which is really impressive, but it can be done. And so, yeah, Reaper is not like some of the other doors where you either have to run in Rosetta mode because one single plugin that you like doesn't work or Rosetta mode and go without it. There is the compromise that, that Reaper can do that. It's been able to do that for years on PCs with the old 32-bit versus 64-bit plugin thing, which has kind of gone by the wayside now, thankfully, but for a while, older plugins wouldn't run in most doors, but would run in Reaper. Reaper has been designed kind of from the ground up to be very flexible, and this is one of the great times that it can do that. Anyway, at this point, I've been rambling quite a lot. So in the next part of the video, we're going to be looking at getting the best audio performance out of your computer because there are some buttons and things you might want to play with if you're not quite getting the performance that you expected. But for now, check out the ultimate Reaper guide on Promix Academy. The link is down below, like I talked about before. It's where we go into super depth and uh, check out everything that we do here on the channel. Thanks for watching. I'm Adam Steele and I'll see you in the next episode.